Oh, I can hear you. Uh, Centrum for Astronomy in Heidelberg. Um, so Melanie, Pierre and Marie Curie University uh, and the Paris Observatory. And in 2016, she obtained her PhD uh, at the Paris D Clouds. Um, she then moved to Heidelberg for uh, a postdoc at the Centrum Um, where she did some awesome work with Dietrich Croissant on the life cycle of GMCs in nearby. Flows within galaxies and how gas is converted into stars and how the stars eject the material back again into the surrounding medium. Uh, we're very pleased to have her visit us today and talk about Take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, I could only hear you, like not not all the time, but uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, yeah, it's really nice to be uh, back in Toronto, even though virtually, as I did my master thesis there. Um, and today, I'd like to talk about uh, the cloud cycle, the cloud scale baryon cycle. So how um, how the matter cycle in galaxies happen between gas and stars and how we can constrain these cycles from observations of uh, at multi-wavelengths and high resolution of the nearby galaxy population. So know that uh, the processes of star formation and feedback, which are respond partially responsible for galaxy evolution, are really seeded on the small scales in galaxies, on the cloud scales. And you can see in this movie here, how uh, uh, the, the gas, the, the densities of gas are condensed from uh, stars inside of them. And then these stars will later blow out this. Uh, and I see that the, the movie is very broken for you, but you can see these big bubbles of empty, uh, yeah, where, where the galaxy seems empty. And these are the bubbles that are blown by the feedback after star formation. So very schematically, we can uh, represent this cycle as such, where cold gas accrete onto galaxies in the form of a diffuse interstellar medium. Within this diffuse medium, clouds will form and assemble, and denser in the denser part of these clouds, star will, uh, stars will eventually form. The stars in, will emit radiation with, at the end of their life, it will uh, explode as supernovae. And uh, the stellar feedback will participate in disrupting the parent clouds and redistributing the matter, the energy, and momentum back into the diffuse interstellar medium. But clouds can also be dispersed dynamically without forming stars. And you can have several, uh, potentially several iteration here between the diffuse interstellar medium and the co cold, dense gas before forming stars. With, under the influence of this stellar feedback, um, uh, galactic winds can be uh, ejected from the galaxy and matter can be ejected back into the intergalactic medium. But the important questions here that I want to highlight is uh, are what fashion of, uh, of the diffuse interstellar medium actually turned into cold gas clouds? what fraction of these dense clouds actually turn into stars and how long it takes for in each of these arrows to go from one step of the cycle to the next. In other words, what are the mass flows that are going through this cycle? Um, and this is a difficult question and it's in particular very difficult to answer it uh, from observations because of course we only have a static uh, picture from observations. So it's difficult to see mass flows. So we can try and turn to, to simulations. And there, in a way, it's maybe even more difficult 
because of the range of temporal and spatial scales. So indeed, if we start from the largest scales, we have gas accreting onto the galaxies. So along filaments, cold, and cold gas filaments, uh, over uh, tens and of thousands of kiloparsecs onto galaxies. And within a galaxy, you need to zoom in by several orders of magnitude to see really where the, the stars are forming, to see these giant molecular clouds and association of stars. Within these stellar associations or within these giant molecular clouds, you need again to zoom in by several orders of magnitude to see the for formation, the location of the formation of single stars. And when you, within them, again, you need to zoom in by several orders of magnitude to see uh, a single star with its uh, protostellar disk. And of course, all of these scales are connected with um, uh, the, the energy and momentum being injected from the small scales to the larger scales through feedback. So in that sense, it's very difficult to say, OK, I'm going to focus only on this uh, middle scale here where I think interesting, uh, interesting things are happening. And we, we cannot just cut out the scale here um, because all of these uh, scales are connected. So it's 12 orders of magnitude here that are uh, important to understand and, and simulate uh, the baryon cycle in galaxies. And it gets even worse because it's not only a huge range of uh, spatial scales, but also temporal scales. If you want to understand the formation uh, of galaxies and the evolution of galaxies over giga years time scales, you need to model what is happening on the time scale of a few years when supernovae explode. So here it's again nine orders of magnitude in time that uh, needs to be accounted for. And of course, it's computationally uh, impossible to cover this huge range of scales, both temporal and spatial. So models and simulations require sub-resolution, uh, uh, use sub-resolution prescriptions where basically all right, uh, all the part on the right of the screen here will be modeled uh, by prescriptions which are not uh, described by first principles. Um, but this is a problem because these prescriptions are uncertain. Um, these prescriptions on which physical processes uh, determine star formation and feedback can be derived empirically from observations. And this is the case uh, of the well-known schmidt kedinkert relation here that I'm showing where star formation rate, uh, the star formation rate surface density correlates observationally very well with the gas surface density on the large scales. But this only gives an indication that, okay, the more gas you have, the more stars you should form. But that doesn't tell you which gas uh, will form stars. And this is very important because you can see on the left now that galaxy simulations with identical initial conditions, but with different criteria for which gas is forming stars, will look completely different, uh, will have completely different properties. And all of this uh, decision makes sense. It makes sense to say that the self-gravitating gas will form stars, or that the gas above a certain density threshold will form gas or that only the molecular gas will form stars. So these assumptions make sense, but we don't know which one is uh, the correct one in the real universe. And this leads to huge uncertainties in the, um, in the simulated galaxies. And the same is true for feedback. Again, three simulations here with identical initial conditions, but different feedback mechanisms. Uh, so one assumed just supernovae, the other one photoionization and the third one a combination of supernovae and photoionization. And again, these uh, assumptions make sense, but they will lead to completely different uh, morphologies and, and properties of the galaxies. So if we want to actually make the galaxy simulation predictive and, and connect this to the observed galaxy population, we need an accurate description of the physical processes of star formation and feedback at the cloud scale. So how can we try and do that maybe observationally? So to try and do that, I'll, I'll first go back to very basic questions that we want to answer. First, 
how do the gas clouds in galaxies collapse to form stars? Do they just collapse very quickly just by free fall? Or is there, uh, is there a mechanism that support maybe the gas, maybe magnetic support, and then the gas clouds can live for longer? The second question is about feedback. So do supernovae or photoionization or stellar winds or radiation pressure, wh which one of these mechanisms halts star formation? Or is it a combination of all of them? And thirdly, what is the resulting rate and efficiency of star formation? Do we have an, uh, so I'm showing again this relation here between star formation rate and the gas mass. Um, and typically, galaxy simulations assume here a conversion factor between the star formation rate, between the gas mass and the star formation rate. Um, we can measure this coefficient from observations, but you see that these two quantities here, star formation efficiency and the numerator, and the uh, time for star formation on the denominator are degenerate. Observationally, we cannot say if star formation is inefficient and fast or efficient and slow. So how can we try and answer this question? One way of doing that is uh, to measure the the time scale for star formation and break this degeneracy. Turns out people have tried to do that for many years uh, and have come up with different answers. So some studies have measured molecular cloud lifetimes of over 100 mega years by the fact that molecular clouds exist between galactic arms in a nearby galaxy here, for example, M51. Other studies have classified clouds based on their stellar content. So um, measuring the number of clouds without star formation, the number of clouds with some star formation, and the number of clouds associated with young stars, we can um, determine what the fraction of the time that this cloud is spending into each of these phases. And basically, if you do that, you get between 10 and 50 mega years for the, the lifetime of the cloud. Then other studies, again, by following gas uh, along the stream of gas, by following clouds along the stream of gas in the center of our galaxies, um, some studies have measured about one million year for the, the lifetime of clouds. So you can see that there are two orders of magnitude here, more than two orders of magnitude that are covered. And until recently, it wasn't clear if this variety was actually physical, because you measure that in different galaxies in different environment, or if these differences come from different experiment designs and subjective cloud classification, for example, uh, which often require to resolve clouds in the example of the, of the second case here. So let's try to answer this question in a more systematic way. What do we want to know? If, if we take a step back, we want to know if clouds live for much longer than massive stars, or if they live for similar time scale. So let's consider these two, uh, these two extreme cases, or either a quasi-equilibrium between gas and stars, or a rapid cycling, where gas turn into stars very rapidly. In one case, you would see clouds that form stars over many dynamical times, in the other case, clouds convert into stars and then get destroyed very quickly. So what you would expect observationally is that in the first case, young, young stars and gas correlate on the small scales. On the other case, they never really coexist, so they decorrelate on the small scales. What do we see observationally? Now that we have ALMA, we can run this experiment in many nearby galaxies. Uh, we have sufficient uh, uh, spatial resolution. And you can see very quickly in that image here that you have blue clouds, blue molecular clouds, and you have red H2 regions. And they don't really seem to correlate, right? Sometimes they're uh, coexistent, but sometimes they're sitting uh, independently of one another. So we have the answer. Gas and young stars decorrelate on small scales, which means that we have a rapid cycling between gas and stars. But how can we actually quantify this decorrelation? And by doing such, how, we can, how can we measure this 
uh, lifetime of the cloud. So for that, we have developed a, a statistical method that rely on this decorrelation, where we uh, measure the gas to stellar flux ratio at different places in this, in this galaxy. So when you do that, Globally, for the entire galaxy, you measure galactic average of the gas to stellar flux ratio. But then when we, you focus small apertures on gas peaks, because you focus them on the, on the blue clouds here, you measure an increased gas to stellar flux ratio. You can do that for stars as well. So if you focus these small apertures on, st on young stars, by construction, you measure, you measure uh, a decreased gas to flux ratio. Now let's do that for different aperture sizes, so from large scales to small scales. Well, it turns out that this uh, behavior, this decorrelation of the gas to stellar flux ratio as a function of scales, is entirely described by three independent parameters, which are the cloud lifetime, and the feedback time scale and the separation scale, the typical distance between individual regions. So we can fit the gas, this decorrelation, or the gas to stellar flux ratio as a function of spatial scale, um, and constrain these three parameters, so cloud lifetime, how long the clouds are living, a feedback time scale, so how fast are the stars um, disrupting their, and the typical distance between regions. So we have done that, we have applied this to uh, a nearby galaxy, NGC 300. So what you see here are now our, our real data. We have measured the gas to stellar flux ratio, focusing on gas peaks, on uh, young stars, as a function of spatial scales. By fitting this decorrelation, we measure a cloud lifetime of about 11 mega years, a feedback time scale of 1.5 mega years, a typical distance between regions of 100 parsecs, and a star formation efficiency of about 2.5%. So you can see that this is quite low. The star formation efficiency is quite low. The stellar feedback uh, time scale is pretty fast, and the cloud lifetime is relatively fast if you compare to the, the range that I presented earlier between 1 and 100 mega years, right? So let's look first a little bit more into, um, in, into these numbers. These were averaged over the entire galaxy, but we can also look into that into more detail and look at how these numbers vary within the galaxy. And I'm, I will present some of these panels here uh, independently. So first, uh, let's look at the cloud lifetime. So it's pretty short, right? About 10 mega years. Um, you can see that it's relatively constant throughout the galaxy, maybe decreasing a little bit toward the outskirt of the galaxy. And it's the, the observations are lying pretty nicely between the free fall time and the GMC crossing time. So it looks like there is no real need for additional support to, to prevent the clouds to collapse, but we have a rapid collapse of the, of the clouds. Now, if we zoom into the um, feedback time scale, again, as a function of galactocentric radius, we have again, uh, so 1.5 mega years for the feedback time scale, it's pretty constant throughout the galaxy. And the, uh, the very interesting thing is this, that you can notice is that this uh, blue uh, solid line here at the top is, uh, sorry, so the blue solid line at the top is what you expect for radiation pressure. If radiation pressure were to destroy the clouds, and you can see that this is way too slow, that this theoretical prediction. So radiation pressure doesn't do much in destroying the cloud. The other interesting thing is that the, the dotted line is the time scale for the first supernova to explode. So about three mega years. Here again, it's actually too slow to destroy the clouds. The clouds are already gone by that time. And it's probably because of photoionization and stellar winds. So early feedback mechanisms will destroy the clouds before the first supernova explode. Uh, for the separation scale, uh, the separation length between individual regions, we have about 100 parsec. And uh, it, 
it's pretty relatively constant again throughout the galaxy and it's very consistent with the gas d scale height. And this is uh, an indication that the uh, star formation is feedback regulated in this galaxy. So if you have a bubble blown by feedback, it will expand, expand. And when it reaches the gas d scale height, the bubble will depressurize and therefore set the typical distance between regions to the gas d scale height. Okay, so we're trying, we're, we're starting to understand this cycle and characterizing the mass flows of this cycle, but only in a small part of, of this cycle, the, the arrows that are in red here, and only for one galaxy. So surely this is not enough. Uh, so with uh, the FANGS collaboration, we've put together a sample of galaxies to do that, not only in one galaxy, but in as many as we can is the nearby universe. And over the years, we've accumulated high resolution observations uh, with ALMA, HST, MUSE, uh, and now with JWST. So um, we have, now we can, we can uh, with, with all of this data, we can determine now not only uh, the star formation and feedback part of the cycle, but also start to look at cloud assembly, um, and not only for one galaxy, but for about 60 galaxies, uh, the nearest galaxies in the universe. So we've done that already for about 54 galaxies. And the first thing that we've noticed is that this, so this characteristic decorrelation here between gas and stars as you go to smaller and smaller scales exists in all the galaxies that we've seen. So this decorrelation, if you remember, is a direct sign that there is a rapid cycling between gas and stars. So we can quantify this cycling. And this is a work done by my student, Jeon Kim. So she has measured the cloud lifetime, the feedback phase uh, for 54 galaxies. And you can see that there is a variety of, uh, of cloud lifetimes and, and feedback time scales here. Um, and the first thing that uh, we were surprised about is that it seems that there is a long time where we see the clouds, so we see CO, molecular gas, but with no, uh, no stars associated to, to it. So this seems to be a long inert phase between 70 and 90% of the cloud lifetime where we don't see stars. So the first question that we asked where it was, is it truly inert or do we simply do not see the stars there? So to do that, we went to far infrared uh, emission to start uh, to see if there was actually embedded young stars in this inert cloud. And indeed there is. So uh, by looking at the nearest galaxies here, the um, six nearest galaxies, where we have Spitzer infrared observations at high resolution, Jeon uh, was able to measure the heavily obscure star formation phase. So between 1.4 and 3.8 mega years, during which the stars are actually present, but we don't see them in H alpha, they're heavily embedded. Uh, but it's still, there is still a, a significant fraction of the cloud that is indeed inert. Uh, during a, a significant part of their lifetime. So pre gems web, we were able to do this only for uh, five, maybe six galaxies. But now we just got with FANGS an approved large uh, gems web program, uh, an approved gems web large program for 19 additional galaxies. And here is the first of these galaxies. So in NGC 628, we have here a C, we have at high resolution CO so for the uh, molecular gas, 21 micron emission, tracing the embedded part of the star formation and H alpha, tracing the, um, uh, um, the uh, exposed star formation. And this galaxy is much more distant than anything we've been able to do before, thanks to the uh, huge improvement in spatial resolution with James Webb. And here again, we measure a similar fraction of uh, the uh, star formation that is um, that is embedded 
compared to the uh, exposed star formation uh, visible in H alpha. So, okay, this is for the supposedly inert phase of the cloud lifetime. Um, the other thing that is interesting to notice is that for all of these galaxies, the cloud destruction phase is relatively short, about between one and five mega years. Um, so this is this is something that had been uh, measured before by resolving by using other techniques of resolving young stellar clusters and age dating them. Um, and they found these studies found similar time scales where the young clusters are found to be gas free after three to five mega years. But these previous studies required resolving an age dating young clusters. So this was only this could only be done in a couple of in a handful of galaxies. Well, now we've been able to do it systematically for 54 galaxies. So what are the consequences of this rapid cloud destruction? Uh, there are two of them that I want to highlight. The first one is that because the clouds are rapidly destroyed, it means that their cloud, their lifetime is limited to a few dynamical times. And this is what I'm showing on the plot on, on the right here. So showing the cloud lifetime as a function of freefall time. Um, so this is not for all the galaxies of the sample, only for a subset. But you see that there is, for most of them, a good agreement between the cloud lifetime and the freefall time. And at most, it's a couple of uh, two to three longer cloud lifetime. The second consequence of this rapid cloud destruction is that clouds don't have time to form stars. They're destroyed before they can form a lot of stars. So the star formation efficiency is limited to a few percent. And this is in, uh, in a good agreement. So these are uh, our observations here. This is in good agreement of this uh, star formation efficiency of a few percent or a few, yeah, maybe 10%. Uh, in good agreement with many different simulations here uh, as uh, color data points. Um, so in addition to okay, uh, measuring this fast destruction of, uh, of uh, clouds, we've been also able to identify that the cloud lifetime and also the cloud destruction time vary with the environment. And I'm just showing here uh, two plots illustrating that. So showing the cloud lifetime as a function of uh, stellar mass on the left, stellar mass of the galaxy, um, and uh, uh, molecular gas surface density on the right. And you see that there is a correlation where basically clouds seem to live shorter in galaxies that are smaller and that are atomic gas dominated. And this could have two reasons, either because the clouds are actually smaller and live for, long, for, for a shorter amount of time, maybe get destroyed quicker, uh, but the second possibility is that in atomic gas dominated environment, um, the CO dim or, or CO dark phase lasts longer. So the cloud assembly phase maybe take longer and we don't see it. Uh, so this could also be an explanation for that uh, decreasing trend of the cloud lifetime towards smaller and uh, atomic gas dominated galaxies. So, let me summarize the, the first part of this talk uh, up to now. So clouds are efficiently dispersed by stellar feedback within one to five mega years. This fact, uh, this means that their lifetime is limited to a few dynamical times between five to 30 mega years. The star formation efficiency is also drastically limited by this to a few percent. Um, and we've been able to answer one of the questions that I was asking of the at the beginning, and star, we can now say that star formation is fast and inefficient. Um, and the second thing is that these processes are environmentally dependent and vary from galaxy to galaxy and also within galaxies. Now, uh, for a second part of this talk, I would like to focus into that, that first, uh, first sentence here uh, and investigate the stellar feedback phase. So, okay, clouds are rapidly destroyed by feedback, but what, in what form 
uh, is this stellar feedback efficient? So to do that, we've compared with theoretical prediction predictions, uh, the supernova time scale. So that's typically between three and 15 mega years, depending on the uh, stellar region mass and early feedback mechanisms. So photonization, stellar winds and radiation pressure. And I'm not going to go into the details of any of these equations here, but just for you to understand what we do is we solve for this equation here on the, on the left, <clears throat> where we propagate the bubble blown by feedback. And when this bubble reaches the, the side of the clouds, we consider that the cloud is destroyed and that sets the characteristic time scale uh, for each of these mechanisms. So for each galaxy, we have calculated the, the prediction associated to these uh, mechanisms and compare them to our, to our observations. And uh, okay, everything appeared at the same time here, but that's it's okay, let me go step by step. So this plot here shows the predicted feedback time scale. So uh, from analytical, uh, the analytical formula that I, on the previous slide, as a function of the observed cloud dispersal time. There is a one-to-one -one relation here, where if the data points are above the line, it means that the predicted feedback is longer than the observed feedback time. So the prediction is in a way too slow to destroy the clouds. For the data points below the one-to-one uh, -one line, it means that the prediction is uh, faster than what we see. And this mechanism is able to destroy the cloud. It's fast enough to destroy the clouds. So if we put the data points now on this, uh, on this plot, you see that for supernovae, all the predictions, so each data point is, um, is a galaxy. Each data point for the supernovae, in the supernovae case, uh, all the data points are above the line. So supernova arrive, supernovae arrive too late uh, when the clouds are are by observations already destroyed. For the case of early feedback mechanisms, where I'm including here uh, the fastest mechanism between winds and, and photoionization, all the data points are below the lines. So winds and photoionization are fast enough to destroy the clouds. So they play an important role in dispersing the clouds, but in fact, they could play an even more important role in a sense they could destroy the clouds faster but that's not what we see which means that their coupling efficiency with the surrounding gas is not a hundred percent but it's lower than that and you have photons or, or winds that can escape uh escape the clouds from load uh, via low density channels um, and you can see an example of that on that simulation here uh, on the right So we can measure this, uh, this coupling efficiency between the feedback mechanism and the surrounding gas by basically uh, measuring the distance of the data points to the one-to-one -one So if we do that, what we measure is a coupling efficiency of a few percent. That's qualitatively similar to simulations, although detail comparison is actually very difficult. So I'm not uh, attempting that here. Um, but the fact that the coupling efficiency is only a few percent, it means that tens of percent um, of, the, of the energy or photons leak out of, of the cloud. Um, and that would explain at least partially the observed diffused ionized hydrogen emission that we see throughout galaxies propagate outside of just the H2 regions that they originate from. We see an uh, environmental dependence of this coupling efficiency, where um, we, we see a lower coupling efficiency towards lower metallicity. So this is consistent with more porous gas at low metallicities. Um, but we don't see a particular dependence of this coupling efficiency with a, a giant molecular cloud surface density. You can see that uh, on the plot on the right. Uh, and the fact that there is no, uh, no dependency on the GMC surface density means that the energy losses 
uh, are dominated by photon leakage rather than radiative cooling during the feedback phase. <clears throat> so um, now that we have looked at the, the feedback mechanism, the early feedback mechanisms, what does it mean for supernovae, for the environment in which supernovae explode? You can look in NGC 300, so Anna McLeod in 2001 has looked at the pre-shock density, uh, ISM density in which supernovae explode, and see that it's only a few uh, particles per cubic centimeters. So this is consistent with uh, what we see, that the, uh, the medium before the pre-supernovae explode, the medium, the medium has been already pre-processed by winds and photoionizations. Um, and if you extend this uh, study, so not only from one galaxy, but to 31 galaxies of the, the FUNC survey, uh, we also find that 60, while 60% 60 of the uh, supernovae remnant are associated with CO detection, but is in 150 parsec, they actually rarely correspond to the CO peaks. So supernovae remnant and, and CO peaks are decorrelated, showing that you have, uh, again, that the medium has been pre-processed before the supernova explosion. And this is very important for the uh, evolution of galaxies at large, because this allow the fact that the clouds have been dispersed prior to supernova explosion allows a large impact of the supernovae on the galactic structure. Um, so that allows the energy of supernovae to be released on much larger scales. And that also has consequences on the stellar clustering and the ISM structure of the galaxy. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. Uh, and this uh, star clustering also has a huge impact on uh, properties such as outflows that galaxies can launch. So second, uh, concluding on that second part of the, uh, of the talk, we've seen that early feedback mechanisms, mostly photoionization and stellar winds, efficiently disperse gas clouds prior to supernova explosions. Uh, the average coupling efficiency is relatively low. And we see an environmental variation with galactic properties. And this has, um, the, uh, these facts have consequences for the redistribution of matter and energy in galaxies and for the subsequent star formation within these galaxies. So these measurements uh, of the uh, baryon cycle in galaxies allow us to determine the detonation environment of supernovae, as I just discussed. Uh, but also in the future, we'll be able to time resolve this timeline. So not only go from uh, gas to embedded stars to uh, visible stars, but do that much more finely using uh, MUSE and JWST, for example. And this is something that we've been able to do in the, um, in the LMC. And I don't know if this movie is going to uh, do very well, uh, due to the connection, but okay, for now, you, what you see is uh, the LMC in H1. So, you know, there is gas relatively diffuse um, through the LMC, and it's taking a very long time before this gas will actually condense and become molecular and be able to form stars. This is about what we have measured is that it takes about 48 mega years in the LMC where you know, not, not much is happening. You have diffuse H1 gas. Um, and at some point, CO will start to be visible. So and some more gas and then stars will start to be, uh, uh, embedded stars will be visible in, in the infrared and then uh, exposed star in H alpha. And then you'll see all the uh, ionized gas lines, such as sulfur-2 and O3, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so this we've been able to do only in the uh, in the MC, but we'll be able to do in much more galaxies in the future. Um, so again, again, the, uh, regarding the LMC, so I just told you. It, 
takes about 48 mega years for the uh, atomic cloud lifetime. So the time it takes for the uh, H1 gas to condense and form uh, molecular, cloud, molecular clouds that are visible in CO. And this is consistent with predictions from galactic dynamics. So if you consider all the dynamical processes that can form or destroy clouds, so the free fall time of the ISM, the collision between clouds, uh, the perturbation, the epicyclic perturbations, spiral arm crossing and, and shear. So you combine the characteristic time scale for all of these mechanisms and you get the blue lines, a solid blue line here that is in very good agreement with uh, the, the measurements of the atomic uh, cloud lifetime in the LMC. So with the future SKA, we'll be able to get high resolution H1 observations and uh, do the same experiment for many more galaxies and maybe be able to um, determine which of these mechanisms is the main responsible for, <clears throat> for how fast uh, atomic gas is converted into molecular gas. So, okay, putting all of these uh, observations together, we'll finally be able to uh, really map this entire cycle and determine what the uh, mass flows that are going through each of these red arrows here. The uh, last thing I would like to touch on is uh, the last point here. We can now test subgrade physics used in simulations. So if we compare uh, uh, the uh, cloud dispersal time that uh, we measure or that are predicted for simulations with the free fall time, you can see that there is a bit of a discrepancy here between simulations, so the, the, <clears throat> the color points, which are pretty much on the one-to-one -one relation, and the observations, which are well below that line. This could be explained by different things. Um, maybe there's obscured star formation. We've seen that this was uh, partially the case. So that implied that we measure an artificially shorter dispersal time. Uh, but accounting for this will only uh, rise the data points by, uh, uh, by the arrow that you see that are there. So it's still not fully in line with the simulations. Another fact could be uh, beam dilution. So maybe we artificially measure longer free fall time in observations. A third point is that, of course, there might be missing physics in the simulation and the GMC timescale that, um, that simulations predict might be overestimated. And we know that there is missing physics in the simulations. And this is an example of this. Um, so this simulation uh, is quite detailed. It has feedback from supernovae and photoionization, and all macroscopic quantities of the simulation uh, and its cloud properties are consistent with observations. And despite this, when we measure the gas to stellar flux ratio as a function of spatial scale, you see on the plot on the right here that um, the, the two branches of, of this, uh, the, so the, the red and blue branches are very flat. The inner branches are for the simulation and the outer branches are for the uh, observations of NGC 300. So basically the, the, the fact that these two branches are very flat for the simulation means that there is no decorrelation between gas and stars. And if there is no decorrelation, there is no cycling. So the gas are sitting there forming stars over and over for tens of millions of years. <clears throat> so basically what this shows is that this simulation, yes, is reproducing macroscopic quantities uh, of observations, but it's doing so for the wrong reason, because the baryon cycle within the galaxy is not what we observe in observations. So a way of solving this, there are several ways of solving this. You can tune the feedback, uh, models, the feedback prescriptions, and let, until you get something that reproduces the observations. And this work, we have done that, and you can make it work. But this is not very satisfactory, right? The other thing is that you can go to high resolution uh, simulations, zooms in, zoom in, um, uh, to have a model, a single 
uh, star formation regions and then import these results and put it into the, the larger scale simulations. And this can be done. Uh, it's computationally very demanding. And of course, even for the zoom in simulations, you have also assumptions. So there is a third road. And this is uh, what we've decided to do is basically to give up. We don't know what physics is causing the destruction of clouds, but we know how fast this happens from the observations. And basically, we can measure in the observations the specific terminal momentum that is causing the, dis the dispersion the, of the cloud. And uh, by just <clears throat> assuming self-similarity, you can derive the injected momentum at each time um, by a given stellar region. This depends on quantities that we can actually measure from the observations. So the specific uh, or observational uh, momentum and the feedback time scale. You can put this directly in the simulation. And this is what we've done in the uh, empirically motivated physics or EMP suite, suite of uh, simulations. And so this suite of simulations reproduce the star formation rate and the Schmidt chemical relation that we see from observations. Uh, and I'm showing this here. Uh, this is the orange line that you can look at. In this simulation, GMCs and young stellar regions actually decorrelate. Um, <clears throat> so again, producing observations, the decorrelation as you go to smaller scales. <clears throat> um, and you see that um, with this new empirically motivated physics simulation, again, that's the orange line here, the gas outflow rate is much slower, much lower, about uh, an order of magnitude lower than what you have for a simulation with simple uh, star from uh, supernovae feedback. This is caused by the fact that the disks are much smoother in this new simulation than if you only have supernovae. Uh, you see that in the gas at the, the, the top of the plot here, and you also see that at the uh, bottom of the plot for the stars. And the fact that the stellar disk is uh, smooth compared to a very clustered disk for supernovae only, does that the supernovae, when they explode, instead of exploding in a clustered way and then driving uh, uh, very powerful gas outflows, they will explode much more smoothly in the gas disk. And if you have only one supernova or maybe two supernovae, it cannot drive uh, massive outflows as a cluster of, of 50 or more supernovae would do. So basically, this, empirically, uh, this empirical feedback does not regulate star formation by blowing out gas of the galaxy globally but locally by disrupting the GMCs and putting the gas in a non-star-forming uh, non forming state. And this is how you reach the same uh, regulation of star formation, but without blowing off the gas out of the galaxy. Um, OK, so let's, uh, let's go back to the question that uh, I asked at the very beginning. What is the physics of star formation and feedback? How do the gas clouds in galaxy collapse? Which feedback mechanisms halt star formation? And what is the resulting rate uh, of star formation? We can answer all of these questions. Molecular clouds uh, live between 5 and 30 mega years. They're destroyed very quickly by early feedback, photoionization, and winds. And all of this together makes star formation fast and inefficient. So in the near future, we'll cover other galaxies with different morphological types, um, so early type galaxies. And at the redshift, uh, we'll use uh, many more observations to really time resolve the timeline of star formation and feedback from gas assembly to the different phases of feedback. Um, and we'll use these observational results to test and improve subgrid physics used in simulations. Um, and uh, in, 
by, by putting all of this together, we'll be able to finally determine the mass flows through the matter cycle in galaxies, both in observations and in simulations. So thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Let me, are there any questions online or in the room? Excellent talk, Melanie. Um, uh, I have a couple of questions about the um, tuning fork diagram and the embedded phase. So um, for one thing, can you help me understand if you are determining the star formation rate by H alpha, that's a that's subject to extinction. And so if you have embedded star formation like you showed, you don't see that um, for a while. So if you included the embedded star formation, you might imagine that you'd improve the correlation between the gas and the star formation rate and thereby change the shape of the tuning fork diagram to something more resembling what you determined from the simulation. So that's mm -hmm. one question. I guess another question is, um, I, I, I can understand um, why supernovae would not be responsible for destroying the clouds um, on a variety of, of physical reasons, like you know the clouds are actually rather difficult for them to destroy given the, um, given the fact that the energy has usually a low density pathway to escape and the clouds are dense and lead to radiative supernova remnants if they're if they actually do explode within them but um the existence of the embedded phase does lengthen the time scale on which you might imagine the stars that eventually blow up as supernovae are are uh, around for so does that affect your conclusion that the supernovae doesn't don't have time to play a role so that was actually, I think, two questions. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Um, so regarding your first question, yes, a uh, child only probe some part of the star formation phase. So we are now trying to include uh, um, infrared emission where you can see the uh, embedded phase of star formation. And before James Webb, we could only do that for five, six galaxies with Spitzer because you need the high resolution, and that was only for the very near galaxies. Um, now with James Webb, we'll be able to extend this. We've done it for one galaxy. There will be 18 more coming. But basically, until now, that's what we've seen here. So um, what you want to look at here is the uh, orange part of the of the timeline where you see uh, CO and the light blue part of the timeline where you see uh, infrared emission. So you see that they overlap for a longer time scale. So CO and 24 micron emission overlap for a longer time scale than CO and H alpha. But there is still a decorrelation. So you're right in saying that the shape of the tuning fork uh, changes a little bit, um, but there is still a decorrelation because there is still a long time during which we see CO and no 24 micron emission, and uh, some time during which we see 24 micron emission, but no CO associated to it. So the tuning fork shape is still visible. Um, so that's, I think that addresses to, to your first question. Uh, for the second question, um, which was related to supernovae. So yes, okay, the, the fact that the star formation might start a little bit earlier than what we see with H alpha might, you know, uh, um, might suggest that potentially supernovae uh, have a, a higher, a stronger role, play a, a more, more stronger, uh, play a stronger role than than what we thought with H alpha. Um, I don't really believe that, and the fact, the the reason is that the time scale that you think for supernovae is typically three mega years. That's a very lower, that's a very low lower limit. 
because that's the time scale for the first supernova to explode if you were already forming very massive stars, right? Which were going to explode after three mega years. In practice, you need time to be able to form these very massive stars. So I don't think the most massive stars will uh, form at the beginning of the star formation uh, uh, in the region. because you, you need time to uh, build up the gas. The other reason is um, one supernova, and you, you said that, one supernova is not going to destroy the gas. If the gas, if the clouds, if the gas is still around, one supernova won't do much. Um, so you will need in practice to wait not only for the first supernova, but for a couple of them to uh, destroy the clouds. And then you're not looking at three mega years, but much longer actually. And during all that time, winds and photoionization can act on the gas um, uh, and destroy the gas much more faster that uh, that what supernovae could do even even if you account by uh, even if you account for this heavily obscure star formation phase okay um, is there a question Uh, I was trying to raise my hand. This is Dick online. Um, I like the talk a lot, um, and I was pleased that you were able to successfully show your uh, movie. I wonder if we could go to your movie for a second. Uh, which which one? The, the uh, movie that uh, showed the timeline and the late appearance of uh, the different elements. In particular, what I wanted to ask about is what is actually in this simulation and how solid do you think the um, kind of intermittent aspects are where one sees that only a little bit of the cloud has got CO? So you mean this, uh, this movie yeah, here, this right? Moving line here, it hits the CO and yeah. you see that um, it's in very, very spotty circumstances of some spatial extent, but not a very large spatial extent. Do you think that's uh, basically a universal result or uh, it's specific to the simulation? So I have, oops, I have to it say this is actually not that. a sim. Oh, what? Yeah, I wanted to pose it and I. Oh, okay, it looked like, I'm sorry, I didn't understand so that. This is this is not a simulation. This is actually observations, uh, but it's, it's cheating a bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was, it was those yellow bits that was uh, yeah. remarkable to me in so, terms yeah. of how so that this information is, is fit in. This is the LMC. Uh, and you know that the LMC is at lower metallicity, so half, about half solar <laughs> metallicity. Yeah. And yes. there is probably, so, it's very difficult to see CO or to see molecular gas in in these dwarf galaxies. Uh, there is actually very little of it. It's not clear whether there is actually much more uh, molecular gas that is not visible in CO. Um, but yeah, this is basically in, in yellow here, what we're going to see here in yellow is all the CO gas that is visible in the LMC there is not more. Wow. Um, and, and you're saying that if you jacked up the metallicity to uh, Milky Way aspects, that would look quite different? Uh, yes, uh, I uh, believe that's, so. Yeah. That, that's just because of the CO requiring uh, two parts of metallicity, I guess. Anyway, that, uh, it's extremely interesting. Yeah. I didn't appreciate that that's actually all observation. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if, if you if you look at uh, a galaxy like like this one here, so CO is in, in blue, and you see that there is actually much more. I mean, it is this is mixed with other wavelengths here, but you see CO yeah. 
not just along the molecule, the, the spiral arms, but pretty much everywhere in the galaxy. Um, but as you go to lower metallicity, it's very difficult to see uh, molecular, cloud, molecular gas. So this is something that we, that's one of the reasons why we want to look at H1, uh, because that would be a way of tracing the uh, a larger part of the gas. But also with James Webb, we can uh, look at pHs, uh, so also tracing the atomic gas or the, the neutral gas uh, in galaxies. And that would allow us, in particular in low metallicity, to not miss most of the gas uh, as we do in, with CO. Thank you. Yeah. OK, I think we're, um, I guess we're Uh, hello. I also have a question regarding with that movie. Uh, could you please open it again? Uh, yes. <laughs> so not happening closely. I mean, they're not tracing each other closely. I mean, you would expect that if the star formation happens too close to CO, it will just photo dissociated. But in this movie, uh, the places where stars are actually forming is very far away from the CO. So is it generally the case? So the reason is, is that this movie is a little bit cheating because of course I'm presenting this as a, as a sequence, mm -hmm. but actually all these images were taken at the same time, right? So um, what, what we've done is to shift each wavelength to uh, what his time scale should be uh, to to make it so this is the time scale for one region but actually each region in the lmc has this uh, is following this this timeline on a different uh, they are not all synchronized right some regions are visible in h1 some regions are visible in co and 24 micron some regions are visible in h alpha and what we're doing here is assuming that all of these are uh, happening at the same time or following the same sequence at the same time. So this is why um, uh, this is why it it appears like this that uh, I, I think what you were saying, I, sorry, I missed the beginning of this question, but I think you were saying that there was a decorrelation between where stars were forming and, and where the gas was forming? So what I would expect is to the stars being formed around CO, but not too close. I mean, but in this movie, it looks like uh, they are not in the same place. They are very far apart. Uh, so like there is no correlation between CO and star formation. I mean, in spatial wise. Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. And, and this is because uh all of the of the all of these wavelengths here are of course observed today the the images have all been taken at the same time today so it's normal that the the clouds that you see are yeah, actually oh, okay. we haven't okay, formed stars yet and the stars that we see have already expelled the gas um, so it's okay. a bit of a trick that we're doing for this to to uh, make this movie but of course all the images have been taken today yeah okay i understand thank you very much okay um thanks melanie let's let's all thank the speaker once again thank you